Did you think we were going to have this many people? No. I was hoping we'd have this many people. And we also have folks online. So thanks to everyone who is joining us online. Uh, my name is President Bill Kelly, uh, the president here at Christopher Newport University. And I am, uh, I am really thrilled that for the opportunity today to, uh, to, to explore our, our past and, and think about our future. Uh, so thank you for all for joining us today for this important discussion. And my thanks to the audience um, here in person and for those joining us through live stream. Uh, Christopher Newport College was founded 62 years ago. And this beautiful room and this spectacular fine arts center is just one indication of how far we have come as a university. The university superbly serves Virginia and the world. We help power the Newport News economy and enrich the lives of our neighbors through the arts, athletics, and opportunities for lifelong learning. That progress has come at a human cost, though, and that's why it's important that we have the conversation that we're going to have today. Today, our goal is to learn about and more deeply understand our history as an institution. What we know is that the institution was located by the city on land along Shore Lane, Shoe, I'm sorry, Shoe Lane, that was home to a valuable and well-established neighborhood. The residents of that neighborhood predominantly were African Americans who lost their homes, many due to the use of the government's use of eminent domain. Our panelists, and I can't thank you all for being here enough. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your lives to join us and uh, for all the work and research that you've done uh, on this topic. Our panelists today will help us fully comprehend the impact of Christopher Newport's growth. And I thank again each and every one of you for offering your expertise and your insight. I look forward to listening and learning myself as a new member of this community and encourage us all to engage in a productive dialogue that will help us as a city and as a university community. Two related programming notes. On Monday at 11 a.m., we'll be having a community walk beginning on campus and then through the Shoe Lane Riverside neighborhood to Riverside Elementary, and then we'll come back. It's a short walk, but it will give us a chance to learn more about the neighborhood next to our campus, and Newport News City officials, law enforcement, and educational leaders will be joining us, and I urge you to join in as well. There's also, there is a flyer about the walk by the doors. I believe we have those set up and ready to go on your way out. And also, I'd just like to say the Torgler Center, the building that we're in here, facility, is hosting two exhibits on the floor just above us in the Edwards Gallery. Those exhibits showcase the work of two prominent African-American artists. My wife Angie and I had the opportunity to visit the opening of the exhibit last week, and I encourage you all to stop by, maybe after this discussion, or, or over the next couple months, to view these important exhibits. Today's discussion, the walk, and the exhibits are important steps on a journey that began more than 60 years ago. There are many, many more steps to come, and this conversation will help us all understand how to take those steps in the right direction. Today, the university is in the listening and learning mode. Our panelists and moderator are here to contribute their personal insights, and it is important to note that they don't speak on behalf of the university, but they speak on behalf of the research and the time spent living in this community. I wanna thank our moderator, Regina Brayboy. She's deeply experienced in guiding events like this. She leads performance-centered consulting and directs a community-based coalition, Healthy Suffolk. She is a senior fellow for, the human, cap for human, human Capital with the Conference Board, and Regina is a member of the CNU Board of Visitors, and she's chair of the CNU's President's Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we just wrapped up our our uh, November meeting just a couple minutes ago. So would you please join me in welcoming our panelists and our moderator, Regina Brayboy. Thank you so, thank, thank you so much, it's uh, great to be here. Um, one of the things I really want to emphasize about my connection with CNU is I started out here as a student a long time ago. And we won't say how long, but, you know, I feel like I'm a student today and, and that's the approach that I'm taking toward this moderation. And so I will ask some questions and also entertain your questions. And I'm excited for the things that we're going to learn about CNU. So I want to introduce the panelists to you. We have Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander, 
who is the endowed professor of Virginia Black History and Culture at Norfolk State University and a public historian and author. Reverend William Spencer is the pastor of First Baptist Church Morrison in Newport News. The church's original structure on Warwick Boulevard was torn down to make way for the university. Audrey Perry Williams is president of the Hampton Roads Association for the Study of, Amer study of African American Life and History. Can you lower the mic? Yeah, Dr. Johnny Finn is a CNU geographer whose research focuses on racial, economic, and environmental inequality that is the legacy of nearly a century of segregationist housing policies. Dr. Philip Hamilton is a CNU historian and the author of A History of the University, and his research focuses on the American Revolution and the history of Virginia. So our format today is that, first of all, you will hear as a live audience. We have a live stream audience. I will um, direct questions to the panelists. Um, we envision this is going to last about an hour and 15 minutes, but if you have to leave, we, we totally understand that. Um, and so, and then there will be an opportunity for questions and questions um, from the audience to the panelists. So I will start with the first question. What happened on Shoe Lane? Please share your perspective based on research of the events and decisions that led to the establishment and expansion of CNU on Shoe Lane and how eminent domain played a role. Dr. Hamilton, you yeah. first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I came upon this story when I was researching and writing uh, the history of CNU about 10 years ago, and I first heard about it uh, during an interview I was conducting with Jim Windsor. Uh, Windsor was the second president of, of CNC at the time, uh, and, but he had worked here as early as 1962, so he was here during the events that, during most of the events that had transpired. Um, and he referred to the Shoe Lane controversy obliquely. Uh, he said that there was uh, considerable debate uh, within Newport News over where to put the campus, uh, and, and he said that, that race was involved. And, and uh, so I, I began to, to research the, the issue more seriously myself. Uh, and now, as everyone knows, when CNU's campus was placed here in the early 1960s, this was a very tense time in Virginia. Uh, it was a very tense time, racially speaking, in, in the state in terms of civil rights. I mean, you had black leaders, the black community that was, uh, that was attempting to, uh, you know, they were demanding integration and equal access. Uh, you also had white leaders who were resisting uh, uh, black demands uh, across the board. Uh, and I also learned from my research that the grounds that we're, we're currently on were owned by a, a small but, but thriving uh, black community that, that dated back as early as the 1880s. Um, now, I eventually concluded by the end of my research that between 1961 and 1963, uh, the all-white Newport News City Council had purposefully taken these lands via eminent domain, uh, not only to remove the blacks who were living here, but above all, they wanted to um, they took the lands here to stop a black real estate developer, a man named William Walker, mm -hmm. uh, from, from building a suburban housing development uh, open, you know, in the open area, the interior of Shoe Lane, uh, these Shoe Lane properties. And, and Walker envisioned this, this, uh, uh, this suburban housing development for middle class blacks who were then uh, leaving the, the downtown region of Newport News as part of the overall suburbanization process that, that occurred after World War II. Uh, in other words, the city wanted to, to halt the creation of a more densely settled black community before it, it even started, one that, that, would, be, one that was, would have been located in a predominantly white section of town, and that's what Midtown Newport News was. It was overwhelmingly white. Uh, but it also, I, I believe they also wanted to stop a, a, a rather densely settled black community, uh, given the location of it to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the James River Country Club, which of course was all white at that point in time. Uh, 
Now, now Windsor told me that there was considerable debate uh, at, uh, you know, in the city, and, and there certainly was as I, as I researched this, uh, uh, this more deeply. Um, there were a series of very acrimonious city council meetings uh, that were packed with both whites and black uh, <laughs> residents here. Uh, and at the meeting, William Walker and his brother, uh, Philip Walker, who was a prominent civil rights attorney at the time, uh, they put forth some formidable arguments uh, uh, against taking their lands. Uh, first of all, they said, they pointed out that, you know, given uh, the Jim Crow restrictions of the era, uh, there were very few good locations for, for, for blacks to settle in in this section of, of Newport News. Uh, and, 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 and so Walker had hoped that this would be one of the few areas where, where blacks uh, could actually live. Uh, they also pointed out that an equally good location was available uh, for the campus to be located on just to the north here uh, at a, along a tract then known as Roy's Lane. Uh, it's where Todd Stadium is, is currently located. Uh, moreover, they pointed out, the Walker brothers pointed out that the, the owners of those lands at Roy's Lane, they wanted to sell, they were willing to sell, uh, and their, the, property, the properties at Roy's Lane were assessed at, at approximately half uh, about half as much as the assessed properties at, at Shoe Lane. Uh, and then finally, the, the Walker brothers even asked the residents of, um, who were living here at the time to write to William and Mary's board of visitors, uh, asking them to intervene on their behalf. And that was because uh, uh, William and Mary was, our CNC at the time was a branch campus of William and Mary. And so we were under the governance of William and Mary at this time. Um, but all to no avail. Uh, the the uh, city count, the, the, the pleas of the walkers uh, and others uh, in, in among the community members, they fell on deaf ears, uh, and the city ended up taking their, their properties or began the process of taking their properties in the middle of 1962. Uh, and then to add insult to injury, uh, the uh, city uh, then tried to undersell uh, the the property the shoe lane property owners by making them offers based on clearly outdated property assessments that were about a decade old, um, and, but nevertheless by 1963 all of the land had been taken uh, via eminent domain and in 1964 the first academic building on CNC grounds was uh, was you know begun to be built. Now lastly, uh, before I hand it off to my my colleagues. Um, in the course of my research, I found that other uh, higher educational institutions in Virginia uh, uh, were doing the exact same thing that happened here. Uh, you know, for instance, in Richmond and in Norfolk, um, you know, as VCU and as ODU expanded because of growing student populations, uh, city planners targeted uh, their expansions into long-established black neighborhoods. Uh, so, so what happened here was part of a larger pattern that was happening throughout Virginia or in areas of Virginia, but also throughout the, the, the country. And so, so, um, so why don't I hand it off to my, my colleagues, uh, uh, in particular Cassandra and, and Johnny, who are experts in you know, neighborhood displacement and, and, and this mm -hmm. whole issue. So, yeah. Cassandra, you want to pick up? Sure. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, I love to follow someone who is very thorough about telling the story, and I have the privilege of just adding a few things to that particular story. Um, as, as Dr. Hamilton said toward the end, there's a pattern. And so one of the things that I'm hoping that you see is the pattern, and that pattern is twofold. One, they were all about creating a solid white section, a section that was receiving a lot of resources from the city as well as from the state. Secondly, it was always Virginia's white institutions that were coming in and taking over those spaces at the time that African Americans essentially were not allowed to even be a student at those institutions. And so you would see this pattern repeated. You mentioned Norfolk, for example. So we're talking about Lambert's Point in Norfolk, an area that had a solid middle class 
middle middle, lower middle class, business owning black community. They were small mom and pop businesses, as were most businesses in this country, by the way. And the individuals who lived in that community were close knit. And when they settled there, they settled in an area that was rural, just like with Shoe Lane. So when, it, when a community is rural, that means that these laws regarding redlining that were put in place by 1940 didn't apply to them. This was farmland. And so people were able to move into those areas. In addition, Shoe Lane, as well as places in what formerly Princess Anne County, which is now Virginia Beach, the what they call the suburbs of Norfolk, Lambert's Point was a suburb of Norfolk. Uh, at the time, they you started to see an African-American community form there in the 1890s. Many of these individuals settled there because that's where the contraband camps were. The same thing was true with Shoe Lane. There were lots of contraband camps. Now, of course, the American government called all African-Americans, both free and enslaved, as contrabands of war during the Civil War. That was a very politically tactical move, but it was also humanely dismissive because contraband is something that your enemy is using to fight against you and therefore you have the right to take or not return that contraband to your enemy. So it's still seeing people as things, as property, as opposed to human beings. And so all individuals who were freedom seeking during the Civil War, African Americans, especially those who had been enslaved, went to these camps. And these camps were usually founded by Civil War troops. And many of those individuals became some of the first students, or their children became some of the first students at Hampton Normal Institute that became Hampton University, or Howard University, or any of the other HBCUs that were created around the time, actually, actually pre-existed the creation, but were anywhere in the 1850s, 1860s, 1880s. These individuals were very much interested in educating themselves, in making sure that they became professionals, and of course, making sure that they passed down so that they paid it back to their communities. They wanted to have a very solid, powerful community that supported each other. And the only way to do that was to be independent, in some cases, in terms of your business, independent, so that the community bought from one another. They, they prospered together. And then, of course, you always have to have educators. And I don't know why our society demeans educators. And speaking as an, a long-standing educator, I always tell people who give me this quote, those who can't teach. I tell them, oh, OK, so that surgeon who just operated on you was taught by somebody who could not conduct surgery on their own? How is that possible? <laughs> you know, <laughs> educators are practitioners of their field. That's why when you have scholars, we publish because we're practitioners of our field. And we hopefully will educate young people, inspire them, some of them to also yeah. become scholars and to build on the work, on the foundation that we've laid for them. And so looking at these different communities, they all had similar uh, origins. And they all came out of this time period of the post-Civil War era. They all, they, they were birthed not randomly, but they were close to where uh, the community, they were, they were in camps close to where those communities emerged, but they became problematic as the white community began expanding out and wanting to consolidate, especially areas of wealth, of white wealth. And these um, com black communities became inconvenient to that particular agenda. And the power of government 
was used against them. And that's not new. And it has even repercussions today. And of course, it's still being utilized today. And not just with schools. There was an entire community that was planned by a black realtor in Norfolk called W.T. Mason Sr. It was supposed to be in the area along Virginia Beach Boulevard, which is currently where Norfolk Industrial Park is located. And he was developing this community because the law, the federal law, did not allow money to be provided to African-American developers or any developers that would create livable, safe communities, suburban communities for African-Americans, would not fund that, period. They funded it only for whites, not for blacks. And here was a black realtor coming up with his own money to create a safe community but that community was inconvenient to the city of Norfolk. Why? Because the people and their children would be near a white school. And they did not want black and white children to go to school together. This was in the 1950s. So this tendency of using the threat of eminent domain or the reality of eminent domain has been weaponized for many years by our federal government, our state government, and our local government. And that is the bigger story of Shoe Lane. And I'm going to hand it off now to my colleague. Well, that's quite an act to follow. <laughs> um, <laughs> First, thanks very much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, I would also like to take a moment to say that um, Phil, my colleague Phil's um, article and book on this are both outstanding, um, but also the recent, and I think the, probably the catalyst for us all being here. Um, if you haven't read the ProPublica series by Brandy Kellum, who's with us in the audience today, I would uh, urge you to read that. It's an outstanding piece of journalism and an outstanding piece of research. And I would urge you to read that on ProPublica, which is not paywalled. So um, <clears throat> I, I think a lot of the points that I wanted to make uh, have already been made. And so I, I want to tread lightly and not um, burn time with redundancies. But I will say, as an urban geographer, I'm particularly interested in the shapes of our cities in the present day and how they are the material kind of end point of all kinds of social and historical processes in the past. And I think Cassandra just said something really important, that this is not random. Um, the shape of our cities today, and if my students are here, I say this every single day to them, the shape, the, the, the actual physical form of our cities is not random. It was put this way, it was built this way to benefit someone. And who did it benefit? It benefited the people who had the power to shape the landscape in this way. And we, whether we know it or not, we live on the remnants of the kind of the, the this, these unequal social and historical processes made real and made physical in the present. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled that we're, that we're having, President Kelly, that, we're ha that you've invited us to have this conversation because whether we know this history or not, we are implicated, we are all implicated in this story. And I just want to, the, the, the only point I think I want to add to this is how systemic, just to kind of emphasize how systemic and how structural and how intentional this was. Um, we've put a couple of the threads that both Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Nubia Alexander mentioned was both the the use of eminent domain to displace black communities for the purpose largely of creating or building white institutions um, and also how that intersected with the racial politics of the moment of the of the early uh, of the civil rights era, and I'll just I'll just highlight so that we have a sense of how systematic this was just in the Hampton Roads region, just in the period of about 1950 to about 1965. 
Um, the way that what we generally under the rubric of urban renewal, the way that the local housing authorities and local governments marshaled federal money uh, to remove the black community in Lambert's Point to build Old Dominion University, to remove a racially integrated neighborhood at what was then called Atlantic City, which is now the home of Sentara Norfolk General Hospital and EVMS, to remove Broad Creek Village, an originally whites only um, World War II housing project for, for GIs that became an integrated neighborhood that was removed and is today an industrial park in Norfolk. And, and there's several other of these, and local historians have done really interesting work drawing the line straight to the fact that in the post-Brown era, where we couldn't have overt uh, school uh, integration, excuse me, we couldn't have overt school segregation, one way that uh, city leaders in the area used uh, eminent domain and used urban renewal funds to create residential segregation and create literal lines of residential segregation in housing to then de facto continue to segregate the schools. Uh, and, and I haven't even mentioned interstate highways, and don't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> but let, let me not go down that rabbit hole. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think otherwise, I think the, the points that I wanted to make have, have been uh, more eloquently made already. So thank you. So much. Um, Pastor Spencer, do you have any comments or anything you'd like to add? Uh, just want to say real quick, and my colleagues have done an excellent job um, providing historical context. Um, and so I just want to add this one quick point just to drive home. Um, and forgive me, I'm, I'm a Baptist preacher. Um, <laughs> anybody know anything about Baptist preachers? We'll tell a story in a minute. And so... <laughs> And I said, hey, got, got a witness there. <laughs> uh, but throughout, throughout, throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, uh, there was a group of individuals called lepers. Uh, lepers was those individuals who had leprosy. Uh, leprosy was a skin disease. Uh, and because they had leprosy, they were treated uh, like second-class citizens. Uh, they were not allowed to be in mainstream society. Um, they were put out of mainstream society. As a matter of fact, they, they built colonies outside the city gates. And so you are confined to these colonies. Uh, if you allow me to contemporize it, you're, you're confined to the, to the ghetto. Um, you, you, you're treated less than, again, because of a skin disease. And so we're here today uh, because a group of families uh, had a skin condition. Uh, it, it wasn't leprosy, uh, but it was the mere fact that their skin had been darkened by Mother Nature's sun. And so we cannot forget that the core of why we're here uh, is because of a group of families that had a skin condition that made them less than uh, the rest of mainstream society. Thank you. Audrey, do you have any, would you like to add uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you for having me. I would like to just say a few things, and um, they have done an excellent job, but I wanted to pose to you um, two questions. But first, I want to say, we've already established that 60 plus years ago, the white leadership of the city of Newport News came in and grabbed up this thriving black community because they needed a school. Oh, you know that, right? Two questions. First, number one, was there another location that the school could have been built? Yes, Marshall. Number two, did they pay the fair market value for the land? The answer is no. Absolutely to both questions, no. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to white privilege. That's what it looks like. And that's what we as black Americans, that's what we see. It doesn't matter, you know, and I don't care whether you got money or not, if you've got that color. That's what this country has done. So that is an introduction. They could have put, built it somewhere else. They said that. Why didn't they pay them the money they had it? Well, hey, I don't have to. I'm white. I got it. 
Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, panelists, for addressing that first question. So our second question has to do with how was, and I think we've alluded to this, but how was the established community impacted by the location and expansion of CNU? And I will come to Pastor Spencer first. Um, well, I want to say this. Imagine, uh, imagine as uh, an African-American uh, people, um, you have survived the brunt of uh, Jim Crow era. Uh, you, you survived being uh, beaten, spit on. Uh, you survived uh, being subject to racial slurs. Uh, you've always heard about that American dream of owning uh, a home. Uh, and now you finally have that opportunity uh, to do such. Uh, you, you've beaten all of the odds. Uh, you, you've... Uh, it, Lack of a better term, you, you started from the bottom, now you're here, <laughs> right? Uh, you've uh, managed to matriculate into uh, university colleges and earn your degree. You've, you've worked, and you've done that all in a society that is still uh, not the best society to live in as it relates to racial tension. Uh, but you've managed to do that. You, you now own your home. You've accomplished all of that to now have it taken away from you. You know, how would you feel, you know, if the very thing that you worked hard for, you sacrificed for, has now been taken away from you? You know, how would you feel if everything that you've done, you've, you've tried to do to leave a legacy, to leave for your, uh, your children and your children's children, to now have that taken away from you at the drop of a dime? And so these are what these families felt. And so um, can I sit here and say that the, the um, placement of CNU, the expansion of CNU, uh, did not have an effect on the community, on the, on the city? Uh, I can't say that. It, it, it did. You know, did it make an economic impact on this area of the city and the city as a whole? Absolutely. But the question that we must ask is, at what cost? And then the question is, do the benefits outweigh the costs? And we got to look at that. It's, it's more than the cost of dirt being dug out the ground. It's more than the cost of bricks and mortar going up. Uh, but there is a greater cost here. And again, do the benefits outweigh the cost of seeing you being placed here and the expansion of it? Audrey? Mm -hmm. oh. I want you to just close your eyes a minute and just listen to me as I make my reflections. I want you to just imagine that you are a descendant of a former enslaved person. Now looking at our history, there are three ways that you can be free. You either escape as a slave, you, your enslaver allows you an opportunity to work and you can buy your freedom. And the other one is that he actually, he or she actually free you. So you arrive in this area of Shoe Lane. Through hard work, you build a home for you and your family. And a tight knit community comes together. You watch out for each other. There is no use of the word me because we become the word of the day. We support and take care of our new family. The community is growing. New people are joining every day. We are thriving, minding our own business and staying on our land. Then all of a sudden, a member of the neighboring white community does a drive-by and looks towards your area. And he, see, he sees all of this prosperity homes looking nice, manicured lawns. And he said, hmm, we don't want them that close to us. They got to go. So they said they need a college. So let's use eminent domain to take their land because they don't need to be too close to us and bringing down the value of our property. And besides, why are we gonna put a school somewhere where they're not gonna learn anything anyway? 
The residents put up a good fight, but they didn't win. For black people, family is important. Why is this true, you might ask? When we were enslaved people, families, as you know today, did not exist. Husbands and wives could be sold away from each other. Children could be sold at birth. When the slave auctions a mother and a baby together, they might take the mother and they throw the baby to the side. And at the end of the auction, they have all of these babies that are there and nobody to claim them. So they are there and this is what they know. Following the Civil War, our former enslaved people were looking for their families. Some found them and others did not. Therefore, that the community that existed in the Shoe Lane area was something that the former residents had to get used to not having, and that impacted their lives as they once knew. The land was not taken because they were not taking care of it and not thriving. It was once again white privilege raising its ugly head. And as from the African, the black American perspective, my perspective, that's what we see every day. It wasn't, they could have used somewhere else to go, but it impacted this close knit community that had come together because during, when we were enslaved people, we didn't have that. So once you get out, you got land, something you didn't own. So now you've got all of this, you want to share it with other blacks in the community, and now all along, all of a sudden the city says, uh-uh, you're too close. We got this neighborhood over here that's white affluent. They've got this segregated golf course. We don't want you over here. So that's what happened here. It's not the matter of there was nowhere else to put this college. It's a matter of racism, systemic racism, that still does exist in this country. Thank you, Audrey. Cassandra. It's hard to follow these two. Um, I'm just going to say a few things regarding this issue. And the first is there's an issue of erasure. So when you talk about how um, the location and expans expansion of CNU impacted the community, they erased them. Yes. When you erase someone, you don't really erase them. You just erase them from your mind. You erase whatever you did to them, you know, your sense of responsibility towards what you did to them. You try to make sure that no one even remembers that they were there. And you try to make it difficult for anybody who happens to still be there to continue to live there. You've erased their, their inheritable wealth. You've erased their, their, their sense of, you know, that I can work hard and, and I can see the fruits of my labor continue to last and go on and on. You also erase their sense of well-being. Because when an individual is put in that situation, there's considerable stress. And stress has health consequences. It has both physical and mental health consequences. And so when you put all of those things together, there's an ongoing and negative impact. And it's not in the past, it's in the present. Uh, because when you try to erase people, this is something that has a generational impact. And it's not just on those who are deeply impacted, but those who were the villains, so to speak, those who were responsible, because now they have to hide what they did. They have to um, somehow create a fictional past 
And we see a lot of fictionalizing today of our history. And I remind people that you don't have a time machine, so you can't go back and change whatever happened in the past. You can lie about it, but truth has a way of always rising to the top. And what are you going to do? You're going to keep lying. And so you create a really bad situation for yourself because everybody knows a liar pretty soon. Uh, and so our society is, is at a critical precipice as we go into, really, it takes about 20 years to get into the new century. So just as W.E.B. Du Bois said that the problem of the 20th century will be the color line, the problem of the 21st century will be how do we reconcile? How do we create this, this nexus point of reconciling what we said about the past versus what actually happened in the past? And how do we reconcile the harm that we did and continue to do with what is, how, you know, how we can move forward? Because you cannot break somebody's leg and then tell them it's time to keep running. You have to heal that leg. You have to help that person heal. And then after healing and after rehab, then you could talk about maybe running. But we haven't even gotten to the point of recognizing, acknowledging that we broke somebody's leg. But I am appreciative to see in you because this event is in my mind the first step, the first and most important step. And that is acknowledgement. But acknowledgement without action is meaningless. And so if you understand harm, the harm caused by this erasure, then you can begin to start thinking about solutions, remediation, and reparative justice. Panelists, Phil, do you have anything you want to add? To yeah, you? I mean, uh, yeah, just in, in, in terms of, of, you know, going off of Cassandra's point about erasure, um, you know, uh, the, the white community did forget very quickly about the, uh, the shoe lane controversy. Uh, but what surprised me um, when I started to, to dig into this was, was you know, how powerfully it was remembered in the black community. And I'll just tell a quick story about this. You know, I had to go downtown to, uh, to gain access to the um, old uh, city council meeting minutes. Uh, and, and I called up, I told them, you know, what I wanted and, and the reels of microfilm that I wanted to look at. And when I got down there, I found that, that most all of the, the women who worked in the office were, were African American. Uh, and, and, and they had actually gone into the uh, microfilm reels and they had actually printed out all of the relevant um, meeting minutes for me. Uh, and, and I wanted to check it out just to make sure they hadn't missed anything. And, and you know, they had not missed anything. And so I was talking to them after I, I had finished up and they said that, you know, they, um, you know, and their mothers and fathers very much remembered this, this story. And that, that really struck me uh, really for the first time, you know, because I had moved here, re, you know, uh, from outside of Virginia. And it struck me just how powerfully this, uh, this event uh, impacted the, 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 the black community, but the white community just, you know, forgot it very, very quickly. Yeah. Johnny. I, I actually I think I'll save my fire for the for the final question. <laughs> okay, speaking of the final question, and I think you know the panelists have really set the table for this question very nicely, and I know you all have been thinking as well. Why does this history matter today? And what steps, if any, should the university, the city, and concerned citizens be considering as we advance forward? And I throw that out as what should students be thinking about or considering as we advance forward? So I will start with Cassandra. Would you like to tackle why this history matters and what steps, if any, should the university, the city, concerned citizens, and students be considering? I'm a student, still a student. 
Yes. Okay. Our question is, why does this history matter today, and what steps, if any, should the university, the city, concerned citizens, and because I'm always a student, and students be considered as we move forward, advance forward? Thank you. Um, you know, as, as we talk about history, um, we have to remember that we study history to understand the present because we're all connected. And what happened in the past does matter very much. It, it concerns, it, it influences the way you see your world. It influences your perspective of what's possible. It impacts the way that you interpret the world, you interpret government, you interpret law enforcement. It impacts everything. It impacts your health. Because when you look at the, the health and well-being of the white community versus the black community, you see, and I've had some firsthand experiences with elderly people recently, you see the difference in how black people are treated in hospitals versus white people. They, these are stark differences, and I'm not talking 30 years ago, I'm talking today. You see the differences in how people perceive other individuals. So history matters. So it's time we get the history right. It's time we stop talking about somebody feeling bad about the past. Who cares how they feel about the past? <laughs> it's important to talk about what really happened. Your feelings are irrelevant. My feelings are irrelevant. If you have those kinds of feelings, you need to go home and get your pacifier again <laughs> because that's like a big baby. Let's, let's be grown-ups and really talk about what happened in the past. And if you are not like some of the people in the past, you should want to talk about the past. Only people who are trying to protect themselves don't want to talk about the racism of the past. And American society has been essentially a racist society as, from the moment that English people walked onto this, this continent and started treating the indigenous populations as an obstacle. So let's be real about that. And for those people who keep claiming to be the descendants of Pocahontas, I want to see a DNA test. <laughs> Having stepped into that big, big pool <laughs> of, of quicksand, um, so be, be honest and real about the past and make sure that that's in our history books. CNU can make sure that every student crossing the threshold at CNU has had a course looking not only at Shoe Lane, but at other areas and having conversations and projects dealing with how can CNU be directly involved in healing and in repairing and in creating opportunities for justice. The other thing that can happen is there are things called federal funds. Cities use them all the time. They use poor black people to fund the renewal so that the poor black people, it's like a bad movie where the black person becomes a hero that sacrifices himself or herself and dies and the only people who live are white people. And so we don't want black people to keep dying and being removed from the picture so that white people can enjoy the fruits of their sacrifice. And that's what a lot of urban renewal funds have been used to do. So we need to put a stop to that and have a change of course so that the people that those funds are supposed to benefit can actually enjoy the benefits of them. And there are things then that can come. This is a university. That means that there are incredible minds here at this university. And it's a diverse group of minds and intellectual capacities from different disciplines, from, from history to sociology to psychology to biology to engineering to all of these different disciplines. Surely plans can emerge out of that. 
And then the political pressure coming from the leadership, coming from the community, coming from the city's political leaders can help to change what was made wrong from the, from the, ori from the origin point so that reparative, and I keep mentioning this word reparative justice, reparative justice can occur because a lot of people actually believe that their privilege is not privilege. They look at other people who don't have what they have and they think that they are the ones who've worked hard and those others are just lagabouts. But the story of Shoe Lane hopefully changes that narrative that you can see that government directly interfered with the, with these families and the hard work that was there and what they had was taken from them unjustly, unfairly, and with swiftness and with decisiveness. Thank you. Dr. Finn, you want to bring us your fire now? Oh. <laughs> Again, I, it's, a, it's, it's hard to follow the people. It's hard to follow my colleagues and panelists up here. Um, yeah, I think, so I'm, I, I just have basically one kind of general group of thoughts when it comes to where do we go from here. And I think we oftentimes immediately identify kind of things that we can do symbolically. This, this panel, in a certain sense, is, is, a, is a symbolic gesture, uh, a historical marker, the naming of a park, uh, these kind of symbolic things that we can do. And I think symbolism is really important. I'm very, very glad that we're here, uh, that we're doing this. Um, but I think where we have to go from here uh, is also, it needs to be material. Uh, and I'll, a re recent study of reparations in California that was commissioned by the California legislature, um, released in 2022, so just a year ago, found that just uh, housing discrimination from 1933 to 1977 in the state of California robbed $569 billion of wealth from Calif black Californians, from about two and a half million or 2.75 million black Californians that were impacted by uh, eminent domain, removal, urban, uh, urban renewal, and all these other discriminatory housing policies just in the area of housing is almost uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars uh, that was taken from black Californians. Now, in the context of CNU and this, the, the, the story that we're talking about today, it's a, obviously a different scale. Um, we're not talking about two and a half or, or two and three quarter million people. Um, however, if we're looking at any individual family, it is the entirety of a home, of a neighborhood that was lost. It's not a piece, it's not 75%. It's, it's everything that was materially lost, materially taken. And I think that even though most of us can say, well, well we weren't here, um, I wasn't, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't born yet. How, how am, why, why am I a part of this? Well, we are. We are a part of this. And I think we need to think about materially, uh, in addition to the symbolic and the representational, how we deal with this material. And I don't have the answer to that. I think we need to have this conversation as a community. Um, I know that uh, Georgetown University is paying reparations to the families yes. of enslaved people who, are, uh, who, who helped to build the university and who were sold in order to keep the university solvent. Uh, I know other universities have scholarship programs. Uh, I think there's curriculum questions that we can talk about. I think there are very real and very material things that we can do, and I hope, I hope, that, the I, I hope that this is indeed a starting point and not an ending point. Thank you. Audrey. I, I think that uh, why this history matters is I'm the president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I'll, Dr. Woodson believed that he needs our story. He feels that our story needs to be told accurately. We have a history. That is why Asala was founded, because they tried to tell us we didn't have one. And I think it's important that 
this story and all of the stories like this are told because we, we, there's no way we can heal, I think, until we accept that things are not right. We, don't, we do not have a democracy because democracy is supposed to take care of and ensure that the majority takes care of everybody, and that doesn't happen here. So we've got a lot of issues, and I think that it's important that we tell the story. You have Mulberry Island that happened, Naval Weapons Station. They took that. They had to give a 60-day notice to come in and visit cemeteries at Naval Weapons Station. So we need to have this history told. We need to stop hiding it. And if I tell people that if you teach, if you tell history like it is, that's all you have to do. But the problem is, is when you start asking a student, how do you feel about something? How does this make you feel? That's when the issues come. But if you give something, a person black and white, they can read it and they can see, yes, they took Shoe Lane. Yes, they took Mulberry Island, Seneca Village in New York. All right, we know that. But what's coming up next? That's the problem. But we have to tell this history. I don't know what programs CNU has um, as far as a way to increase your I know black pop student population here for one thing, and I read, I don't know, the most recent figure I had was 7%. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think that for our area, a school that's built on land that was taken from black Americans, we need to see something a little bit better. We need to see, uh, I, 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 like I said, I don't know what you have in place, but I, I do know that some schools, you know, they go out and look for the best and the brightest, okay? And, you know, they don't want to do about that anymore. But I have two examples of Christopher Newport. My granddaughter is 29 years old. She was an honor student. She came to Christopher Newport for a college tour. She spent the night. When my sister came to pick her up, you know what she said? I don't want to go back. So I don't know what you all are doing here to encourage it. And about two years ago, one of my friends from Maryland, she moved to Alabama uh, last year, but she and her son came to CNU for orientation. They spent the day, they heard the, the uh, president and all like that, and they were supposed to have an interview at three o'clock. Do you know why his mom was somewhere and he was somewhere? He called his mom, you know what she said? I don't want to go here. They don't want me here. So I don't know, I mean this was a couple of years ago, so I don't know what you're doing, but, and I like what Cassandra had mentioned earlier when we talked about a requirement that this history is taught when those freshmen come in that door, that they're able to move forward. She mentioned earlier about having a walking tour. Let's get them involved. But not only here, but I mean, it's just amazing that we've got all of this technology. We've got this outstanding institution here, and we're not represented. And like I said, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not working. And we got to do better. Hello. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll keep my... I'll keep my remarks short so that we have as much time as possible for, for questions. But I do think it's, it's so important that we remember uh, this history. And, and I'm reminded by uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Brian Puaka, his, his, he gave a, a talk at the commemoration where we dedicated Walker's Green. And he said, you know, what we choose to remember just as much as we, what we choose to forget makes us who we are uh, today. Uh, and, and that's very, very true. And so, so you know, like, like Johnny, I, I hope that this is the beginning of, of a conversation, a conversation that will certainly make, uh, you know, some of us, probably all of us, uncomfortable at one point or another. But it is important that we have these, these conversations. Answer up. Boy, I'm going to give a Baptist minister the last word. <laughs> so that we can get to Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, up until this point, I, I questioned um, 
why I was actually here. Um, why, why, why me? And, and up until now, I realize I'm adding the balance to everything and not to uh, downplay the importance of history uh, that my colleagues have talked about, understand it greatly. Uh, I do understand the importance of it. Uh, but I also understand what, what, what the word tell us. And it says to forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past because God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing. And so I'm looking for a new thing to happen at CNU. Um, CNU was birthed out of racism. And so uh, it's and it's evident that it's still here, as my colleague has mentioned. And so but you all have the ability to change that narrative. And so I'm looking for a new thing. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for diversity and inclusion to not just be a word thrown around like a used toothpick, but to actually mean something. I'm looking for that to change the hiring practices. I'm looking for that to change in the admissions. Uh, we've talked about ODU. We've talked about uh, VCU. Uh, ODU, uh, you look at the enrollment, 45% white, 29% black. Uh, VCU enrollment, 43% white, 18% black. Here at CNU, 75% white, 6% black. It's time to do a new thing here at CNU. Uh, what better way to honor those who were displaced? You know, reparations, you know, that's great. Scholarships, that's great. All those tangible things, that's great. And I, I think it's needed. But what better way to honor them than to have a university that looks more like them than to say, we displace you from your home. But not only that, we don't want your children, your grandchildren or your great grandchildren to attend the very institution that put you out. Seeing you, it's time to do a new thing. We have time for some questions, and so the, the acoustics in here are pretty good. So, <laughs> so there is a microphone, but you can try it from where you are. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I didn't want to like awkwardly shamble. Um, hi, I'm Matt Johnson. Oh, oh, right, right. Thank you. Thank you. So I will awkwardly shamble. <laughs> okay, is this better? Is this all right? Thank you. Um, this is more of a, like comments, sort of my experience, but also to you know foment discussion. Um, but I'm Matthew Johnson. I am a senior. Uh, English history major, so obviously I'm here, um, and passionate about this because I am black, I am queer, and I go to a school where that is not actually popular. Um, and I think it's really important, and we talked about like having this and why we're doing it. I think it's important to be discussing this right now because while it did happen in the past and while we need to focus on the past, Part of uh, focusing on this right now and part of what we're doing right now is trying to uh, change CNU's culture. Because I think this school, I mean, we're a PWI, 75% white is insane to me. Um, we are a school built around a premise of, of whiteness, look around. And this school, the culture within favors white students, it favors whiteness. So when we're looking here to Shoe Lane and to what the school has done, I think we're starting a progress uh, towards a cultural shift. When I think about Shoe Lane and what we're talking about, I think about um, a talk I had with a current professor here, Dr. Santoro, former president. Some of you might be grumbling. Um, he told me that when he was the president here, he actually went out to the black communities and instead of saying anything and recognizing what CNU is and what it was and what it did, he looked to black congregations and churches and to the members of a black community and told them that they are not African-American but that they are American and that they should stop emphasizing the hyphen, 
that African American. And instead of recognizing who we are, he helped to build a culture of ignorance and erasure that Dr. Newby Al Alexander yep. mentioned. I'm also going to check my phone because I had notes. Um, and so I think when we're here and talking about this, that's, that's sort of where we're starting. And if we also think about why we're here, we're not here because everyone started suddenly, not to be skeptical, but everyone started suddenly caring. We're here because there was publicity. The, this was called out. The university has to respond or else we look like we don't care. But I, it's, it's not to downplay what's happening. We still care, we're here, we're talking about it. But I think it's worth exploring why we are. Um, and I think, too, that the culture at CNU, again, is built around um, ignorance, is built around erasure. Uh, I think about Shoe Lane, and I think about the fact that every year uh, I see my residents, I'm an RA, they come in and ask me how ghetto Newport News is. Um, which is insane to me, but to them, because the area around us is black, it's ghetto. How the campus itself, certain areas are considered ghetto because they are predominantly black. And how um, they are coming from these upper middle class areas, Nova, and looking around at uh, destabilized black community and pointing to black people and the community around us as the ones who put themselves in that position. We don't, we don't consider, largely in America, we don't consider um, that it was whiteness and white supremacy that put black people in that position, but we place the impetus on the black community um, as the ones to, who have put themselves in that, in that situation. Um, and I think my final point, sorry, I'm really bad at being brief. My final point is that I do think there's so much that can be done at CNU, this is a start, but I do think there needs to be these sorts of institutional structural changes. A DEI curriculum, that is something I actually worked on with Dr. Hopkins to propose. I went through the course uh, catalog and I tried and we worked and we submitted it and it has largely been ignored. If, from what I understand, it's actually being reviewed because the issue of race uh, is too much to handle. So. We're here talking about Shoe Lane because CNU was built on, thrives off of, and still exists as a racist institution that destabilized an entire black community. And so many of the thousands of students here do not really realize, do not care, and instead benefit from um, everything that we destroyed in creating the university. So I think that we as students, uh, those of you who are here, like we are the ones that have to put the pressure on university officials, on administration. We are the ones who have to start leading the education. We are the ones who have to place that pressure because we see it's typically when pressure is placed that a conversation starts. Otherwise, this will, will have another Walker's Green situation. We'll do something symbolic, and a few years later, we'll have to do it again because everyone forgot. Like, we can't let this be it. I mean, we're having a walk Monday, um, but we have to keep having these walks. We have to keep talking. And so I think, as I'm leaving the university in May, that this is something that has to happen now. And it has to happen so that the university's culture itself can change so that we can actually be a better university and so that we're not just throwing around words and symbolism. I think we owe it to the 20 black families that we displaced and the lives that we ruined and the community and city that we destabilized to do something as students and faculty members um, for the future and to establish it in posterity at CNU. That was a lot. Dr. Hamilton. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Moderator and distinguished panelists. My name is Winston G. Favor, and I'm a CNU alumnus of the class of 2003. I have lived and breathed this community because of my work through the Manners Museum with the Hidden Histories Program, where I researched the family of the African-American men who built the museum. Many of them attended First Baptist Church Morrison. I have two comments and one question. My first comment is, 
just to correct the history, the original First Baptist Church Morrison was actually on the property of the Mariners Museum. It was not in front of, it was not on Warwick. Um, second, the current mayor of Pittsburgh, Ed Ganey, he is from the line of Talton, which was a family here in this community. So my question for you all is this. Did the organizers of this program consider contacting the descendants of the family from this community to participate today? I ask because the families can give you personal perspectives that will bring this whole thing together. No disrespect to anyone that's on the panel, but everyone is really talking either generally or based on just what they've learned. And in my opinion, we need to hear from the family representatives that are in the audience today. We have the school's perspective, we have a general perspective, but not the community's perspective. So with that, I say thank you. Yes, um, good evening, good afternoon, well, it's still afternoon. But first, I want to define the area. Shoe Lane, yes, was a major drag, but you also had Moore's Lane, which was a part of that and Prince Drew Lane. That was the area that was targeted for this conspiracy that started this university. My next point, uh, which is when we have this conversation, I'm assuming we will continue. Yes, seeing you was the benefactor of that, but as we have learned, it wasn't just the university. You had city council, and here tonight, I'm very happy to say we do have City Councilman Long, who's here. So there are certainly, you're, you're being heard by City Council. Um, granted, it's not the current City Council that was here, but nonetheless, they are representing that entity. And perhaps even the State Department, because this conspiracy opened the doors for this to happen. And in order for any solution to be brought forth, you have to have all those stakeholders there. Um, they may know of different ways and solutions to bring forth any type of reparation or change that we might think is appropriate for what has happened so that we can move forward. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Millicent Brown Wilson and I live on Moore's Lane. And I've heard a lot about Mr. Walker and his brother, but I want it to be known by everyone in this room that the land from Warwick and Mariner's Museum, where Ferguson Center is now, down to Prince Drew, down to Moore's and Corbin and Shoe Lane, was owned by the Johnson's family and I think they need to be recognized. And please stand up. So the taking of the land was the land that was owned by this people. Not quite sure how the walkers came into play, but that, own, that land was owned by that family. Also, I wanted to kind of piggyback or land back on something that Cassandra said, which is typically people tend to say a lot of times, we as black people should pick ourselves up and do better and work hard. I don't know if you understand that the people who own that land were doctors, dentists, lawyers. I can speak for my father. He was one of the first black men as an aerospace engineer at NASA. There were principals, there were teachers. So these are not people who were just, just hanging around and not taking care of business. They worked hard, they had, they had bachelor's degrees, they had master's degrees. Back in those days, that was very, very unheard of from black people. So we did not just, happened to be here and nobody gave us anything. My parents worked very hard as well as all the other families that lived within that area. And we indeed were a family and a, tr and a true community that looked out for one another and took care of one another. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm old and I'm white. <laughs> So 
here it is. Every white person in here, we were taught to be white, to be better than anybody else, right? And it wasn't overt. It was in the movies. It was on the radio. Well, because I grew up in the 50s. It was on television. White privilege is taught. And you have to admit that to yourself before you change. And until we, white people, change, this is going to keep going on. The, the things that you guys talked about, absolutely true. But I heard this in the 60s. And it seemed to disappear for a while. Right? We thought, oh, we're all better now. Right? And then what happened just in the past 10 years? Right? It became okay to be white and powerful again, which is BS. We have to change, and we can change at the university level, but that's not where I learned to be white. I learned to be white at home. So you young people, you're the one who's gonna change things with your families. Us old people, we're, we're useless. We are useless. <laughs> if uh, my advice to you, never vote for an old white guy. <laughs> I had something important to say. I forget what it was. Because <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> but we do need to change. You know, I've, I've been around. I'm not from this area, but in the 70s, I spent six years here. I was in the military. I went on and did other things, but I've been around the world. And I will tell you this right now, this whole notion of white supremacy, it's a name that I think white people gave themselves because I have never met a more insecure people in the world than white people. We're not we're not superior, we're afraid. Thank you. We have time for a couple more, so if you're planning to come up, please, please come up. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Kevin Lyles. I'm on the um, alumni board, actually. I'm, uh, I graduated back in the 1900s, and, um, <laughs> and I wanna, I wanna um, kind of throw a little bit of light and a little bit of positivity into some of the things that have gone on today. Thank you for the council. I enjoyed everybody's comments. Very pertinent. Um, but I want to emphasize that um, seeing you does have a distressful past. I, I've been here since um, 1983. I met my wife here. Um, I believe my family uh, comes from seeing you. And but I want to say some of the things you talked about today, 6% uh, African-American, that's not the first time I heard that. I heard it from President Kelly. And I think you got the right people in place now that we can have this discussion. Um, uh, Adelia Thompson, great person. There's people here that are absolutely set on getting this problem right. But I want to talk to you also just about, um, you mentioned, um, kind of loosely that we're not looking at history. I think African-American history should be taught as a mandatory thing. Um, because uh, there's a Clint Eastwood movie I like where he tells his Marines, you need to improvise, adapt, and overcome. And if you've ever looked at the history of blacks in this country, we have prospered and overcome and achieved in spite of every obstacle put in front of us. And that's why everybody should be studying black history. That's the example you need to learn. That's the success that you need to learn. So thank you. Good evening to this great panel, to my pastor, Pastor Spencer. My name is Marion Kirby. And I have not heard Royers Lane mentioned tonight. I was born and raised on Royers Lane. And it was a very close neighborhood 
Everybody loved everyone, mostly families, and most of us was relatives. What I would love to do, if I could, speak to the panel or the city, the men that were from the city that came with a school was supposed to have been put down in Royals Lane. As you can see, the school is on Ward Boulevard. And uh, we moved, had to move out, scattered people all over the place. But the worst thing of all, it was deliberately done. Up in Oyster Point, there were thousands of, lane, of uh, acres of land that they could have put two colleges this size on. But they came, and like they have already explained to you all, they took our land. Yep. But you know why I feel good? Because I know that all white people are not the same and not like that. But there is one thing certain. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what went down. And everybody that's guilty, they're going to answer to the Father. Mm -hmm. But I would love to look at them eyeball to eyeball <laughs> and tell me, why did you do that? You had to do it out of hatred. Yep. Because the land was up there, trees. Yep. They had to cut all those trees down mm -hmm. to do what they did. But they came instead and took our property. God bless. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Dwayne Johnson. And I guess I can say, in short, legacy lost because it was my father, his father, and my great-grandfather that all grew up on, uh, or worked that land. My great-great-grandfather bought a little over 30 acres that is now covered by the college for the most part back in 1907. So this land had been in our family for over 100 years. Now, it's kind of funny that a lot of the move to put the college here happened just after my grandfather submitted plans to the city to build a housing development for middle class blacks. OK, so we're looking like uh, late 50s when this when this occurred. So now come this early 60s, eminent domain. We now see what is left of that. So basically, I just want to put a face to one of the families yes. that lost a lot mm -hmm. during that period. And the other thing I want to say, as a longtime resident of Shoe Lane, growing up on Shoe Lane, knowing William Walker, I was friends with his grandkids, I consider it an insult that he has a plaque on that land because he was a purchaser from what was considered Johnson's Terrace. That vision of that, of that neighborhood was not his. It was my grandfather's. He was the one that submitted plans to get it done. And ultimately, he was the one that had his land taken. So that vision was lost. So I don't know where that information came from about William Walker growing up in that, that neighborhood. I've never known him do anything to help the neighbor. The thing is, he was just a purchaser of that land, and he just built a house. As far as his vision, helping us out, I have no knowledge of that. Okay. So I just want to set that straight and let you know, yeah, I do find that Walker's green and then salt. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jennifer Burgess Brooks, and I'm the president of the Newport News NAACP. And I thought it would be remiss if I didn't say anything, but I did want to say this on this evening, and that is thank you all for what you have done. You have came here and you've given us history, and we thank you for that. But I just say today, where do we go from here? And I'm kind of kind of going to bounce off of what Pastor said, the Baptist pastor preached this morning, what he just said, and that is that we need to be represented at CNU. You know, and not just represented, but feel like that we are part of CNU. Take ownership that we are a part of the university. And I also want to say that I thank Dr. Kelly for this, 
this is the beginning of something great. You know, we have already had conversations about um, making changes and coming up with ideas about how we can make things better here at CNU. So we've already began to have those conversations. But I think that this is a great start of something new. This is the first of many meetings that we need to come together. This is not just the first meeting, but I hope that we're going to have more meetings where people come together. And I also have to say thank you to those families. I just have to say we have to give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just pray healing for you. I pray healing for you. We talked about healing. You know, um, the panel talked a little bit about that. And we talked about history. But the day we also want to change history. We want to create new history, good history. And we know the history that we've had. But we want to create new history as well, where we're seeing our students that are benefited, benefiting from this. More African-American students at CNU being involved. More properties here in this area. And so I just wanted to say that to you. Thank you so much for the beginning of this. And I hope that this is the first of many minds coming together. Thank you so much. The last, last speaker, unfortunately, we are really, really running out of time. So Sorry. I will give this young lady a chance. Good evening, my name is Chelsea Hodo. I'm a sophomore here at CNU. Um, I don't wanna turn this into a political debate, but I am of the belief that race is inherently political because of the systemic oppression, oppression that this country and also this school was built on. Um, Governor Yunkin has made a mission to eliminate what he calls critical race theory in Virginia education, which he considers any divisive discussion of race. <laughs> And I just hope that um, the university continues to stand by what was said today and continues to try to make amends even when there is pushback from political parties. Oh, yeah. I would like to thank all of you who came out first and all of you who are live streaming our program. I want to thank the Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. I don't know what the printer was doing, but that is the Dr. Cassandra <laughs> Newby Alexander, <laughs> Reverend William Spencer, Ms. Audrey Perry Williams, Dr. Johnny Finn, and Dr. Philip Hamilton. Thank all of you. And I really would be remiss if I did not thank our President Kelly for his leadership on making sure his leadership on making sure that this conversation happened on this campus. We have a DEI council, which I chair, and the university is committed to leaning into this issue and seeking higher ground, as President Kelly often says, and I take him at his word. So thank you so much. I hope you have a safe journey home. And this is the beginning of a conversation and more actions to come. Thank you.